All right. We are 0 for 2. <laughs>Hey there, Reviro 311 here. I am holding a Japanese Maruku musket that was imported via Dixie Gunworks. I picked this up for about $1,000 from actually a fellow reenactor. Uh, he was uh, willing to sell it for me for a pretty good price, so I'm very happy to have it. I spent about $1,000 on this gun. You see them go online from anywhere for uh, about twelve to fourteen, sometimes $1,500. So what are these Maruku muskets? Well, these were made about 20 to 30 years ago. I've seen as far back as 35 years ago, and they were imported to the States. Uh, Navy Arms also imported these Maruku muskets. You can tell if they're Maruku because they actually have a pretty unique uh, mark right here on the lock plate. I'll show a picture of that after I've cleaned up my lock. I've been shooting this most of the day. I think I've shot about uh 40 or 50 rounds so far i've been trying to get my you'll see it in the footage i've been trying to get my hold on where i need to aim with it it's it's a good shooter i've had pretty good reliability off of the action uh the only problems i've had so far is just you know it has to do with the flint so if i swapped out the flint that's perfectly fine but yeah enough of talking i'm gonna take a shot down range at our uh, steel target down there hopefully i hit it I'm finding that I have to aim low to so hopefully make this happen. There we go. I'll have to go down there and pick up that steel target. All right, welcome back. I was able to put that target back up. So I am shooting 110 grains of 1F Schutzen black powder. I should have done a little bit more research. I'm going to preface this in that um, I am very new to shooting black powder in general. I've shot it at reenactments, but obviously that is completely different than shooting it and um, shooting balls down range. As you can see, my gun is starting to get there because we've been fired a lot and I've yet to clean it. So if you have any recommendations or if you see something that I could work on, uh, just let me know. I'm happy to learn. I'm by no we, no means an expert. I'm just a humble YouTube channel. I like shooting historic guns. And this is modeled off of a historic firearm. So let's take another shot. I guess I missed. So I'm trying to find out where to hold... Hold my powder. Actually, I'm going to make sure to put my hammer on. That was a little bit unsafe, what I just did. Trying to figure out where to hold. It seems like you have to aim a little low. And uh, it's, it's, been a, it's been a process for me, having that explosion right in front of my face. I have a decent amount of experience shooting. I was rifleman in the Marine Corps. I was a combat marksmanship coach and a combat marksmanship trainer. But I will admit, this is, this is a completely different experience. I'm very happy to be doing it. Anyways, more about the Morocco's. You'll see them um, stamped Dixie Dun Gunworks on the barrel, like I mentioned, and they do not make them anymore. Some unique pieces about it is that they have a two-piece stock. I think this is Japanese cherry. This is based off of a French musket, a model from the system of 1766. It has the hallmarks of that it has the flat lock plate the flat cock the u states that is stamped right here on the face of the buttstock that is that's from the american revolutionary war in 1777 congress told the continental army start stamping their um, their guns and equipment so we have records of that being and it would be either right here on the face or underneath the buttstock we have the barrel is held in by three barrel bands and then it also has this um, screw and the tang in the barrel. These barrel bands come off by pressing these springs. So it's held in by spring tension. But like I said, this is just me shooting. So seems like I was trying to aim a little bit low, maybe right there at the bottom. I'm probably at 25 yards. <laughs> like I said, I'm no expert at this. I'm just out here having fun in the woods. So let's...
I think I'm hitting well. So we'll load up another round and put our hammer hammer stall back on. So interesting thing about these guns is that over a hundred thousand of the French infantry muskets would find their ways into the arms of Continental soldiers. The reason that there's so many is there's a few reasons why so many of these French guns ended up in American hands. And one of the main reasons is because, well, the French wanted to get back at the British. So let's get in there. Yeah. And so the French were more than willing to covertly than overtly support the American cause, and they provided us with French muskets. The French muskets they did provide were actually the outdated models, such as this. This was in 1766. The French were swapping over to the model of 1777. They had a more, it was closer to parts interchangeability, and they had these guns that were not able to be swapped parts with with the 1777. They had, the 1770 has a different lock, different cock, uh, just got a shorter barrel, shorter stock. So there's really not much you could have used off these older 1766 muskets. But all right, maybe we'll just try to aim high. I think I'm aiming too low. So yeah, 17. These models of 1770 or 1766s would find their ways to American hands. How they got here was the French actually, in 1776, they set up a shell company called Hortelez and Roderick. And the purpose of this, it was actually a Spanish sounding shell company, is that they would get millions of livres and that shell company would then be used to purchase weapons and bring them over to the United States. Well, actually, they bring them to the Caribbean. And once in the Caribbean, they would be smuggled into the United States. It worked out pretty well. So these guns were not very prevalent in the early war. First shipments really, the first shipments in 1777 in the spring. But it's really not till 1778 when the Continental Army goes into Valley Forge, in which at Valley Forge they start to have more of these French guns. And then that summer at Battle Monmouth, you can expect to see these French guns with a lot of work. So, okay, let's keep going, see what we can do. Well, as you can tell, I'm not meant here to be a marksman on this day. So, these guns start to make their ways into American hands, and by the end of the war, over 100,000 of these guns have been delivered, maybe up to 200,000 of the system of 1766 have made it there, there. The light division, the flying division, that was under Lafayette, the siege of Yorktown in 1781, they would be almost entirely armed with French infantry muskets. So, let's aim. Let's aim low. Okay, we're gonna aim high on the next one. And we'll just kind of figure out together where it's at. Another kind of misconception about these is that these would be called Charlevilles. This is not a Charleville musket. If you're new to the channel, um, well, hopefully you learned something from this. And if you're a returning visitor, you know that I talk about this decently quite a bit. Basically, the naming convention of Charleville. Charleville is actually the Royal Armory in France, but it's one of many different Royal Armories. You would see it stamped on the lock plate. Charleville, Mabou, saint Etienne. And then later, Tool would be uh, armories in which the French would make their guns. But this is not. Oh, let's see. Yeah, we're starting to get too clogged up. So we'll call this the last round. And whatever. Like, <laughs> this is going to be a process where I learn how to find where to hold this gun.
All the other YouTubers, they seem to just hit every time they go, so. I'm going high. And yeah. So this was not known as the Charleville during the American Revolutionary War. Charleville, like I said, was an armory in France. During the war, these are known as French muskets, light muskets, French infantry muskets. There's also the heavy versions. At the end of the American Revolutionary War, these muskets were very prevalent in the national armories, well, the arsenals where the guns were stored. And in the early 1790s, following the disastrous defeat of the Americans at the Battle of Wabash, one a Battle of Wabash in which I think about 800 Americans were killed, which is about two to three times more than was lost by Custer at the Battle of Little Bighorn. But after that defeat and then the the campaigns into that Northwest Territory, which would now be Ohio, the U.S. Army actually, well, Congress sets aside the funds to create the two national armories, Springfield and Harper's Ferry. Springfield and Harper's Ferry then select their first pattern of musket to build, and they select the Charleville pattern of musket. That is a uniquely American name. So if you want to say American Charleville, that is correct. So the American Charleville muskets were made from about 1795 at Springfield first, all the way up until about 1818, I think, was the last time when Harper's Ferry is making it. Springs, Springfield starts making it before, and it becomes those 1795. But anyways, as you could tell if you've ever seen one of those, is that those borrow very heavily from the French infantry musket design. Um, that's basically about it. I got that awesome smoke coming out. I am very sweaty. It is actually the day before the 4th of July. And I just thought I would make one of my first videos of me actually shooting rounds down my musket. I need to figure out how to get my aiming on. Um, but yeah, like I said, if you have any recommendations, you see something I'm doing wrong, maybe, I don't know, just let me know. YouTube comment section. I'm always down to learn. Thanks for watching this video. If you get a chance to pick up a... Navy Arms Co. or Dixie Gunworks or Moroku French Musket, the model 1766. They are known as a pretty good piece to buy. It's quite lightweight. It's a fun gun to shoot. I don't do it justice with the accuracy. But that is all I have for today. And until next time, take care.